Well, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, thank you for coming to tonight's lavish co-production from the Competitive Enterprise Institute and Mr. Christian Josie. Here, here, Christian Josie. Here, here, here. As Fred said, I'm Ian Murray. I'm the head of the Oops, Center for Economic Freedom here at CEI, and it is my privilege to introduce you tonight to the authors of this fine new book, Debacle, Obama's War on Jobs and Growth, and What We Can Do to Regain Our Future. And as somebody who worked for the major government in the UK, I know a thing or two about debacles. <laughs> Is it debacle or debacle? Debacle. debacle. No one, I'm the only one on one word titles. Some titles <laughs> never argue pronunciation with the real. Now, in my opinion, the authors of this excellent volume need no introduction. But just in case there are any visitors from out of Mongolia here tonight, I'm going to give them one anyway. <laughs> Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform, is in many ways the great eminence of our modern free market movement. He is known to conservatives as the man who brings together economic liberals, social conservatives, and defense hawks to fight a common foe. He is known to libertarians as a tireless fighter to reduce the size of the state until it is small enough to drown in a bathtub. <laughs> and he is known to viewers of The Daily Show as someone with a beard. <laughs> and that characterization might tell you much about the state of the political understanding of the conservative political philosophy on the left, which is one of the things that got us into this debacle. In any event, Grover has won fight over fight after fight with the left on his signature issue of taxation. No wonder they hate him. Grover's co-author is another hate figure for the left and a long-term friend of mine, John Watt. John first came to my and most people's attention when he proposed the simple, yet at the time seemingly counterintuitive idea, more guns, less crime, in the 1990s. <coughs> Having newly arrived in the US, I had a typically British disdain for gun rights, viewing gun ownership in the home, as opposed to the grass moor, as faintly distasteful. I rehearsed a few of these common British arguments in an article about John's theories, and he had the good grace to call me up to dispute them. Jettisoning my British disdain for niceties like facts, I followed up John's points and realized he was correct. His arguments turned me from a gun grabber to a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Indeed, I'm not sure whether it was paternal instinct bursting through or John's influence that caused my first words on seeing my baby daughter to be, I've got to get a gun. <laughs> And since that time, John and I have even shared a cyber stalker, the deranged Australian computer scientist, Tim Lambert, who followed me from the gun debate to global warming, where he continues to construct ever more bizarre conspiracy theories to an ever diminishing audience. <laughs> now Grover and John will doubtless tell you much more about the content of their book, but I want to draw your attention to one chapter in particular, chapter five, entitled Regulatory Thuggery. Regulation is what we live and breathe here at CEI. And in my opinion, this chapter is an excellent introduction to those toxic fumes. Grover and John detail several of the most important aspects of this administration's regulatory assault on American business. How Obama has vastly increased the size and scope of regulation. How they have attempted to spin away the clear fact that this is the most anti-business administration since the New Deal. And provide excellent case studies of the thuggish nature of the assault on the auto and health insurance industries. Most importantly, however, they spell out why this happened. The simple fact that the president and his team of top economists just don't understand how business works. Without our observation, I'd like to hand the floor over to Grover and John so they can tell you more about the spin and dissembling they sweep aside in books, but also what we should do about it and how we should remember Archimedes. Here, here. John, do you want to start? Thanks very much, Ian. Well, we just <coughs> got special effects here, I guess. Um, well, uh, kind of the motivation for this book, Grover and I were uh, having breakfast one day, and uh, you know, there are lots of criticisms that have been made about the Obama administration, but it's not really clear that people have kind of explained why the policies have failed. So. You know, people will say, well, he promised 8% unemployment if, uh, if the stimulus got passed. Then they'll say it went to 10% and they'll point out it failed. But what I think needs to be done sometimes is to actually explain to people why the stimulus increased unemployment, why it slowed economic growth. And so we're partly doing that and going through some of the side arguments. They'd say, well, uh, if we didn't have the stimulus, it would have been even worse. 
And I think there's simple explanations, simple economic arguments that can be made, but they just haven't really been made. And then we go through and try to uh, explain how some things could be changed in order to try to make the economy better. You know, you look at uh, uh, the growth that we've been having in jobs, and since the beginning of the recovery, we've had about two million new jobs that have been created. But there's two ways you can reduce unemployment. You reduce unemployment either because people got jobs, or you reduce unemployment because people gave up looking for work and are no longer counted. You're only counted as unemployed as long as you're actively looking for work. Well, since the recovery started, we've had two million jobs, but we've had seven million more new people enter the roles as not in the labor force. That's something you've never seen before in a recovery. I mean, people leaving the labor force is something that you see happening uh, during receptions and then during a recovery they're supposed to be entering. But we've had, you know, three and a half times more people leave the labor force during this recovery than we've seen uh, enter. i just show you one growth here. This is just percentage growth in jobs during recovery since 1970. And uh, these lines right here, the dotted line is kind of the average dashed line, but you can see uh, there's, we have the five recoveries here. The, Three up here at the top are recoveries from bad recessions. The two mild recessions are basically here. Usually the worse the recession is, the stronger the recovery and job growth that you have. So, but this black line here, this has been the job growth that we've had during the current recovery. I mean, you can see this is kind of the first time where it's actually negative growth. And it's only been very recently, and I would argue basically been after the stimulus has largely ended, that we've had any increase in job growth at all. And there's really, you know, from an economist standpoint, it's really simple explanation for why the stimulus actually increased unemployment. You know, the first notion you have to understand is that government basically just moves money around. You know, whether it's taxes or borrowing, it's basically taking money from one place and moving it someplace else. It's taking money from where you and I or businesses would have spent it to where the government wants it spent. And the problem is, is that when government moves around those resources, it moves around the jobs that are associated with those resources. So if you add up this $825 billion stimulus, you add up you know, the four different job spills, you're talking about well over a trillion dollars. And when you move a trillion dollars from where the government, you know, from where you and I, the companies that we would have spent the money on, to where the government thinks, you got to move all these jobs. And the problem is, is that people don't move instantly from one job to another. You may reduce jobs in the oil sector and Louisiana and Colorado and move them into solar energy. But even if people can fit into the new jobs, it's not like they throw the kids in the back of the car on uh, Friday night and start work in California or some other state on Monday morning. It takes months or even a year or more for people to go and find those jobs. And it's not just the stimulus. You look at all the different regulatory bills that have been, you know, everything from credit cards to financial markets to uh, uh, health care to uh, EPA regulations, we could go on. One of the things, as Ian was saying, there's basically no time, no two-year period where we've had as many new regulations passed as we've had uh, during the first two years of the Obama administration. And the thing is there, just like with the stimulus, you have winners and losers. Certain companies gain, others lose. You're moving jobs, massive amount of jobs, even if it's kind of, kind of balanced out. Uh, it takes time to move jobs from one sector to another. And that churning, that chaos, temporarily increases unemployment, temporarily reduces output as you're moving people from producing something to going around and searching for jobs. Now, one of the things about, uh, um, there's a long chapter that we have that kind of goes through this argument in many different ways about, well, things would have been worse. And one small part of that chapter is just kind of comparing how the U.S. Uh, economies looked over the last few years compared to foreign counterparts. And one obvious comparison is to look at countries like Canada and Germany, countries that Obama singled out for criticism for not following, specifically in his own words, the type of Keynesian policy that he advocated. And I'll just show you some of the numbers for Canada here with regard to unemployment. I could also show you for GDP growth. But if you look from like the middle of 2008 to the beginning of 2009, where the stimulus happened, 
uh, the United States and Canada's unemployment rates basically moved in lockstep. It was only after the stimulus passed in the United States that you began to see separation between the two. That our unemployment rate continued to rise, Canada's rose slightly more, leveled off, and began to fall. You know, you can go through and look at predictions uh, with regard to Germany in particular, but also Canada from Krugman or others that were predicting disaster for these countries for not uh, following the type of advice that, uh, you know, the Keynesian advice. You know, I, I just mentioned one brief criticism of the type of Keynesian model. Uh, we, we go through a lot of things, but, you know, so many times we hear things like unemployment insurance is a good way to stimulate job growth in the country. You know, the thing is, saving in the Keynesian model is basically like digging a hole and putting money in the hole in the backyard someplace. Everybody's spending the money. It's not like transferring money from one group of people to another increases spending. And the reason, way to think about this is if I give you a paycheck, what do you do? You put it in the bank. You may spend some portion of that money directly, but what does the bank do with the rest of the money? It just doesn't sit on it in the vault someplace. It goes and either buys bonds or it goes out and loans it directly to people who are going to go and spend it. So when the government transfers the money, it's just transferring who's spending it and what it's going to be spent on. It's not creating new spending that's there in the normal type of approach that is usually talked about. So, uh, just so one question, and I'll just give you a brief view on this, is kind of where did the stimulus money go? Uh, you know, a lot of people have discussions about, you know, Solyndra and whatever, and we have long discussions about some of the waste involved there. But, you know, if you go back to the original signing statement that Obama made and a lot of the arguments, it was supposed to help out the people who were in most trouble at that time. But if you actually look at the numbers there, well, it's very perverse. If you look at either poverty, uh, bankruptcy, foreclosure rates, income, unemployment, it's not the places that were worst off that got the most money. It's the places that were best off that got the most money. And I'll just show you a couple things. If you look at bankruptcy rates here, basically more stimulus dollars, uh, the people that places got the most stimulus dollars had relatively low bankruptcy rates. The places that got the least stimulus dollars here had relatively high bankruptcy rates. Or I can show you for, um, you know, this is, uh, okay, and I can show you other things. Maybe these got mixed up a little bit. But the, uh, let me just show you this. So this is for uh, poverty rates here. Again, relatively low poverty rates got relatively more stimulus dollars than places that had high poverty rates. So what explained where the money went? Well, uh, one of the things you can look at is basically high union states. I mean, we know a lot of the restrictions in the stimulus to make sure that Basically, you, you know, union jobs would get subsidized. And in fact, if you look across states, states that had relatively higher percentage of the workforces had more, that had, were unions, got more money. But one of the big things that explains it is essentially the makeup of your congressional delegation. I mean, congressional, Congress is what wrote up the bill. I know you're shocked, Fred. I'm sorry. I probably should have checked with you about this before I would go off on these types of, uh, you know, bizarre claims. But the, uh, but the point is pretty simple, that the states that had the biggest percentage of their congressional delegations as Democrats got the largest per capita stimulus transfers that were there. And this is even excluding D.C. I mean, any of these graphs that I show you, I, these are just states. I mean, D.C. is so far off the map in terms of per capita. I mean, anybody who goes and looks at uh, property values over the last few years, you know, you know the place that's been increasing basically has been D.C. relative to the rest of the country. Now, I just go, as I mentioned before, uh, Grover and I go through a lot of the uh, kind of the explanations about, well, you know, things would have been worse, but they also have excuses in there about why things haven't worked out. So they kind of got all their bases covered there. And uh, I'll just show you one thing. One of the things that's gotten a lot of attention has been this claim, you know, Obama's raised it many times. Uh, Geithner just raised it uh, within the last couple weeks. The claim is that countries that have financial crises uh, have more severe and longer recessions than those that don't have financial crises. Well, uh, I know Ken, have known Ken Rogoff for, I don't know, maybe 20 years, but there's a really bad problem in what they did. 
And the thing is, when they were looking at unemployment rates across countries, they used the unemployment rates from each country. The problem with this is that different countries define unemployment differently. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics for, for basically nine countries has gone through and made sure that, you know, for those countries, what would be the unemployment rates and how would they change over time if you use the same measure of unemployment? You know, you know, there are differences in terms of how hard you have to be looking for a job before you're classified as being unemployed. And the thing is, you think you want to make sure you're all measuring these differences across countries the same way. If you, if you use the reported rates that aren't this measured the same way, you in fact find their claim that uh, the countries with the worst financial crisis had bigger increases in unemployment and lasted longer. If you use the measure that actually has them all measuring unemployment the same way, it's the reverse. So you can see here that, uh, so here you have uh, the countries uh, not in uh, financial crisis is the dark black line here, and the countries with the financial crises you can see here, you basically see it a much bigger and statistically significant increase higher in, un in unemployment uh, for the countries not facing a financial crisis than the ones that are.